William D. Eggers is co-author with Donald F. Kettle of the new book, Bridge Builders, How Government Can Transcend Boundaries to Solve Big Problems. Now executive director of Deloitte Center for Government Insights, 30 years ago, Eggers ran the Privatization Center for Reason Foundation, the nonprofit that publishes Reason Magazine. He's worked with dozens of governments at all levels, both in the United States and internationally, and he's written a shelf's worth of books on the proper scope and functioning of government. I talked with him about bridge builders and what he's learned over the past three decades about making government more effective and less intrusive when confronting major challenges such as pandemics and why it's long past time to move beyond what he and his co-author call the vending machine model of government. Will Eggers, thanks for talking to Reason. It's great to see you again, Nick. Uh, we've known each other 30 years yes, now. Yes, <laughs> that is, it's, it's kind of sobering, right? Um, your new book is Bridge Builders, How Government Can Transcend Boundaries to Solve Big Problems. You co-authored it with Donald F. Kettle. What's the elevator pitch of Bridge Builders? Basically, our political and policy debates are mostly based on an outdated mental model, uh, what we term the vending machine mental model of government, which is you have a big problem, you pass a law, you fund an organization, you put money into the vending machine, and you're expected to produce results. Uh, that's what we read about in the newspapers, we see it on TV, and that doesn't reflect either how government operates or how you can actually solve any big problems right. today. Like take a problem like homelessness. Is it an economic problem? Is it a mental health problem? Is it a housing problem, a crime problem? Or And whose responsibilities is it? Is it local government, state government, federal government, nonprofits, foundations, does the private sector care? And the answer to all those questions is, is yes. And so what we need is a new model to look at public management and government that reflects the reality of a big blurring of the lines, really, between the public and private sector. And the key to effective government today is really the ability to effectively manage these public-private networks. Before we get into some specifics about stuff, let's reflect a little bit on your history, both at Reason Foundation. Uh, when I interviewed uh, for a job and I joined in October of 93, you were already working there. You know, you're like Bartleby the Scribner. You were there when the, <laughs> office, when the guy shows up in the office. Um, but you were running, or you eventually ran a, a center for privatization. And um, talk a bit about you know, when in the early 90s, when your career started, what were the challenges and what has become? Because you're talking about the vending machine model is outmoded. That's not how governments operate. What were they, you know, how did, how did that happen? You know, I started off right out of college uh, working at Reason of what was then called the Local Government Center. And it was really doing the nitty gritty of kind of local government management and how do you deliver garbage collection or wastewater treatment in areas and of course at the, the school time buses, things and at like the that, time yep. people wanted to go to think tanks and do sexy policy things and I originally thought oh my gosh what is this and then I saw just how important that work is and it's also a lot of work that most think tanks don't do they don't do implementation they just want to debate policy ideas so that's what made reason in the, then the local government center and then the privatization center and center for government reform so unique and at that time there was a lot of debate really about who should be providing these different services should it be the public sector the private sector sort of a mixed thing and there's a large debate that debate is is largely over today uh my friend steve savas uh wrote literally 35 years ago about how government should steer, not row. And increasingly, that is that is no longer something that is debated, uh, whether it doesn't matter on the Republican side, the Democrat side, what ideology you have. Increasingly, government is playing the role of um, steering rather than right. actually rolling and, and itself. And funding as well, right? I mean, like a right. lot of the money. And yes. one of the things that was fascinating in the book, I didn't realize, um, you, you talk about how in, during the Manhattan Project, 
like a ton of that stuff was outsourced to private industry um, because one of your previous books, um, you know, if we can put a man on the moon, dot, 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 um, it's kind of, there's a long tradition going, you know, back really centuries uh, in Ben Franklin's autobiography. He talks about get, you know, fulfilling a contract uh, that he got, a governmental contract that he got for delivering stuff to the border or the frontier in the French and Indian War and stuff. But the Manhattan Project, talk a little bit about how like they farmed out different parts of that. It was, it was the Manhattan Project where then General uh, Leslie Groves uh, was the person who was in charge of this. And he had to find a way to build the atomic bomb, but do it in a lot, have, with a lot of secrecy. Right. And there was a, literally tens of thousands of academic researchers and people from private industry and some government who are all working on different elements of it. And Groves was one of just a few people who knew how all the different parts were working. And that actually, we saw the very similar model in the Apollo mission of when we foot first put a man on the move. That was James Webb, uh, who listened to Kennedy's call. And, uh, and he was instrumental in organizing this vast network and when you look at the Apollo mission, it was over 22,000 uh, different firms that were involved in that, academic research centers everywhere, NASA employees. And so we have this history of doing big things. And when we do it, it's usually through these very blended models. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think in, in many respects, the U.S. has really led the way, you know, probably over centuries in, in developing these sort of very sophisticated network models. But it's hard to find something that we've done that you can say a really big accomplishment that wasn't done in this sort of right. a model. Um, when you were uh, starting out at Reason and whatnot, the, one of the big books that was in the air and concepts was Reinventing Government, uh, which Al Gore and um, I'm struggling to remember his name, Bill Clinton. You know, it's uh, funny how quickly people kind of fade from consciousness, but they, you know, they were talking a lot. That was part of their pitch as like new Democrats, that they were going to reinvent government. Can you talk a little bit about that book and how that is you know, that has had like a serious influence along with, you know, people like Bob Poole and Steve Savas, you know, talking about privatization. Well, absolutely. Actually, David Osborne, one of the co-authors of Reinventing Government, actually gave us a nice blurb uh, for this book. But that book really did usher in a whole wave of government reform and a focus on good government, effective government in a nonpartisan way during the 90s. And that for those of us who've been looking at public management, and that's, for me it's three and a half decades, that was really the heyday of, of a lot of that. We saw a lot of very business-minded mayors who focused on pragmatic things of making these cities run, like Steve Goldsmith from Indianapolis, who I wrote a book with. Uh, you had Ed Rendell from Philadelphia. He was a, Dem I mean, a, so a Democrat. Goldsmith, a Republican, Rendell, and Rendell, a Democrat. And then a lot of governors, like yeah. William Weld, who's mm -hmm. been featured and you've had on your show mm -hmm. before, uh, John Angler and others. So it was a really big focus. And one of the reasons why it got so much attention, of course, was because Bill Clinton was seen during his campaign actually walking around with it. And then, of course, yeah. the, and famously, Al Gore went on the David Letterman show and he looked at these ashtrays that cost so much. And then they had big forklifts that they showed all these government regulations. So they did a really nice job messaging and kind of making government reform sexy. Yeah. What the was the what was the impetus? Was it a sense because this is, you know, coming after the Reagan years and, you know, Reagan was a revolutionary or whatever, but he was very popular. H.W. Bush, you know, was kind of popular until he lost re-election. But, like, why were Democrats uh, championing a, n a new way of delivering government services? Was it, and I guess, was it because it they had failed in the older model or were we out of money? Like, what were the pressures saying we got to do something different? Well, I think, you know, some of it was, of course, a lot of the New Democrat mantra. And there was think tanks like the Progressive Policy Institute, led by Will Marshall and my friend Rob Atkinson, who were putting out studies along these lines. And really, people were looking at a lot of the sclerosis that was occurring at the time in a lot of our big cities and government institutions. And really, how do you how do you fix that? 
And uh, so it was not only, though, the Democrats, you had a lot of these real reform minded Republicans who made this a big part of their governing philosophy at the state level from Tom Ridge mm -hmm. uh, to William, William Weld, uh, uh, Tommy Thompson right. out of Wisconsin and, and others. Is it easier? I, I guess it is easier to do it at the state or local level or that that's where the delivery of services really kind of takes place. It, it is where the delivery of services takes place, although under the Reinventing Government Initiative, I mean, they did reduce the size of the government workforce more than we've ever seen any administration yeah. do it. And they been basically down to the same size that as when John F. Kennedy was president. Which and, is kind of fascinating because the government is, I mean, Bill Clinton's last budget, I think, was $2 trillion in nominal dollars. We, you know, we're now spending over $6 trillion on a regular basis, it seems. But the amount of workers paid by the federal government is smaller. Right. And that really shows a big point of our book is that most of what government does today through the federal government is not direct government paying employees right. and so on. It's through what are called indirect tools of government. It's through tax credits and contracts and grants and loan guarantees and areas like that. And we actually estimate in the book that about 94% of the federal budget is through these sort of more indirect tools uh, of government as opposed to direct government action. Yeah, and I'm looking at, I mean, this was uh, one of the things that really uh, made my head explode. Um, in Table 5-1, you talk about the federal government's financial footprint, and out of total outlays, and you 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 come to a number. You know, there's the uh, this is from 2021, so it was 6.8 trillion dollars, uh, which is a record, which I suspect will be broken sometime within the next five years. Um, but you know, a chunk of that is a, a large chunk of that is through things like um, uh, tax expenditures, uh, which are, are tax cuts or tax loopholes, uh, subsidies and things like that, loans and whatnot. And so the total footprint of the financial footprint of the federal government is more like um, 11.7 trillion. And you say only about 458 billion of that is, to, you know, Peep, the government putting a check in somebody's pocket. Exactly. So we, we end up, you know, having all of these yeah. debates about a tiny little percentage mm -hmm. of the actual government budget right mm -hmm. now. And in fact, when you look at how, especially in the United States, when we're trying to realize different policy goals or have behavioral changes or do various things, increasingly policymakers are using these indirect tools because they they don't have to say they're growing the size of government before and they're trying to oftentimes catalyze markets and catalyze the private sector to do various things to achieve broader goals that they might have, whether it's climate action or workforce development. Um, let's go through a couple of specific examples of where government, you know, over the past couple of decades has successfully, you know, solved big problems or addressed them. What is the what's your top of mind example for that? Well, you know, I, I mentioned, uh, of course, the Apollo mission and written a lot about NASA over the years because I do think it's an exemplar agency. And even when you look at the commercial space industry, which uh, I'm incredibly bullish on space and what's going to happen there, uh, the commercial space industry would not exist anywhere near it exists today without NASA and NASA playing a role as a catalyzer of this industry. And in fact, uh, in Walter Isaacson's new book about Elon Musk, I don't know if you've read that. I have yet. not yet. But. It's, a, it's a great read. Yeah, I've yeah. known Walter a long time. And he's got a quote from Elon Musk where SpaceX almost went bankrupt at one point. They're in real trouble. And then they got an anchor uh, contract from NASA uh, that allowed them to then start investing. And even Musk, who's no huge fan of government, as you know, he, at one point he had as his password to his computer, I love NASA. Yeah. So NASA's done a really good job of being what we call a catalyst by design Okay, agency. and let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Musk, uh, we did a video about him a couple of yeah. years ago about, you know, he is a, more than a master of markets. He's a master <laughs> of getting government subsidies and incentives uh, for sure. Um, to walk through that, because NASA, you know, after the Apollo 
you know, mission kind of and whatnot. They generally, the knock on NASA is that it's a really bureaucratic, um, kind of stuck in its way, risk averse culture. Um, so, how, but, but you're right and you document this in the book that NASA is the reason why there is a big private space, you know, kind of industry that's going, how, how does this work? And how does it show the new kind of blended government model rather than that to the vending machine model? Well, if you think about NASA and without the commercial space industry, without the sort of all the incentives that they created for that to flourish, NASA might need to be two, three times as large to do what, uh, you know, what they're doing right now in terms of space travel right now. So what they did was they had a big change a couple decades ago, starting with Charlie Golden, who we I talk about in the book where they said, we're going to focus on catalyzing innovation. We're going to focus on creating incentives and systems to, to actually get the private sector essentially to, to build what we need to meet the rich mission of NASA, but also at the same time to expand the opportunities for space travel. And so they've done hundreds of prizes and challenges, open competitions for, from an innovation standpoint. They use tools like competitive grants and, of course, their procurement contracts. They have over 20 different technologists, people who are just focusing on what are the technologies in these different markets and how, how are they progressing, how important are they for, for NASA. So they're doing market sensing at the same time, and they're creating a lot of channels to academia and private industry. And I think increasingly that's really the future of government agencies. Hmm. And was that mostly under Obama? that these shifts uh, took place? Uh, a, the shifts have been going on for a while, but yes, a big acceleration under under President Obama. And what's interesting, if you look at a big acceleration, this notion of public-private partnerships, uh, the Obama administration was a big driver of these and yeah. everything from space, and we saw it in the defense world, we saw it in even areas like foreign aid mm -hmm. and, uh, and elsewhere, but it's not just you know that administration and that in the George W. Uh, Bush administration, our former colleague uh, Lynn Scarlett was the Assistant Secretary of Interior, mm -hmm. and one of her major accomplishments was to to really drive public-private partnerships in the national parks mm -hmm. to really improve that and bring the communities more into the administration of parks. Are there you know are are there any surprising challengers to this kind of thing? And I know like when you talk about something like the national parks, and then you say you know what we're going to contract out uh, you know the vending machines or the you know the franchises and a bunch of the amenities and maybe even the upkeep and stuff. You know, like obviously anybody who is a public sector employee is going to be like, no, this is you know a, a sacred trust, and you can't have like you know private contractors. They pay less and they, you know, they don't care, et cetera. Um, but who, you know, who else are the surprising people who are like, no, no, we really have to keep the government, you know, directly funding everything? Well, I think what we really try to focus on in the book, and my, my co-author, Don Kettle, is kind of the dean of public management in the U.S. He's written 25 books on public management. So it's very much a non-ideological, non-partisan look at this. And increasingly, the debates are not about uh, whether something is contracted out or not. It's about what's the right mix between the public and private sector. And what we try to focus on in the book is that the private sector is now putting in essentially trillions of dollars into creating different ele elements of private uh, public value. Mm -hmm. And so how can government leverage that? So it's a lot less about necessarily who should be delivering that service, but how do you bring the different sectors together to produce the most public value? That's, that's how Houston has been able to reduce homelessness by 63% at the same time when it was going up in other so cities all over the country. So explain how they did that. What, what does the, you know, the kind of local government of Houston do and or you know, to the extent that it matters, the state government and the federal government, like how how does Houston figure out how to fix homelessness? I live in New York City. They're not doing such a great job of it. And certainly there's a lot of West Coast cities that are just really abysmal. 
Yeah, I mean, Houston has now put over 26,000 individuals in permanent housing over the last decade, three-fourths of whom stay in permanent housing, 63% reduction, which we haven't seen almost anywhere else to that extent. And there's a couple key elements to it. Certainly, number one is they've taken the funding from federal, state, local level, uh, foundations and individuals and companies, and they've been able to bucket a lot of the funding together, which okay, is important. That. Well, because the siloed funding processes are one of the biggest obstacles to doing all this. When you look at most of our problems, they go beyond the boundaries, the legislative boundaries that have been set for them. Uh, and so what they need to do at Houston, they took funding from HUD or HHS or the state level, and they were able to then put pool all of that money. And then there's a a nonprofit called the Houston Coalition for the Homeless, over 100 different provider organizations. And Mike Nichols was the orchestra conductor, kind of, because that's how we look at this, of bringing all those organizations together. And another key element is just the data system that they created. So previously, before they got started down this road, the mayor, Annalise Parker, then would say that you could be having in different organizations. And again, these are mostly nonprofit organizations, some for delivering services to a homeless individual and not knowing what other services they had gotten, not knowing where they were in the journey. They couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't share information. And they built a system so that they could share all that in, in real time, that they could measure outcomes and they could see, well, this individual uh, this is the services that they need, the services they've received, and they can be monitoring that at all times. So they went from being kind of just a number to really the kind of the life history of each individual glued together by the state. Is that system. primarily, uh, you know, and the name of the book is Bridge Builders, and you talk a lot, you mentioned the, the phrase, an orchestra conductor, um, you know, where somebody who is overseeing everything, right? Um, so it's like Leslie Groves or or whatever. Is this, you know, is it primarily individuals who, you know, you have to have the right individual in place or is it a systems approach so that you are, you know, and how do you balance that? It's, it's definitely both. Uh, we found, you know, we profiled dozens of these amazing, amazing bridge builders across all the different sectors. And it's really hard work. You have to look out for bridge builder burnout. And one of the keys to being good at this is understanding deeply how each of the sectors work. And sometimes those are called tri-sector athletes, people who have worked across the sectors. Who so what is that? Uh, government, private industry, and nonprofit? Yes. Yeah. And, and you could say academia could right. be another one and, and so on that's involved. So those individuals who could navigate across the sectors is really important. We think we need not thousands more, hundreds of thousands, but really millions more bridge builders. And when I speak at universities and grad schools, which I do all the time, this is the sort of thing young people really want to do. It gets them really excited and Well, interested. that's because they get to be the orchestra conductor, right? They're not third oboe or, or something. Or they might want to be. Not all yeah. of them want to be the conductor. Yeah. What goes into that then? I mean, is it, um, you know, is it like is it getting people to shift between these sectors like during the course of their career? I think absolutely having that sort of thing where people might spend some time in government, some time in private industry, you might work at a foundation, a nonprofit, and being able to move across those sectors, or even have tours of duty where you might go into the private sector or public sector. Because if they don't understand each other, if you're in government and you don't understand the value that the private sector can bring to a right. big initiative, you're going to have a hard time then creating as much value as you could. Uh, but those that we found that were very successful really had that deep understanding of the different sectors. That's why NASA has tried to do so much to create those various channels. And we do have uh, some tours of duty now in the federal level, U.S. Digital Service or 18F, a White House Innovation Fellows. I think we need a lot more of that. For when you say have tours of duty, it's people have like kind of term limited yeah, they might go in there, for then, three years to yeah. five years and then move back out again. Um, you know, one of the uh, um, uh, undertakings that you talk about uh, in the book, which is really interesting, is Operation Warp Speed or, you know, the kind of federal response to COVID, right? And this is, you know, I think without being overtly ideological about it, it's, you know, like 
at the highest level possible, it's kind of a clusterfuck. You had, you know, the FDA and the CDC and a bunch of other agencies shutting down, you know, the early people who were trying to figure out what was going on to do early testing. They, you know, kind of threw a monopoly blanket over different parts of the response. Um, but Operation Warp Speed, which was Trump's kind of saying, okay, we're going to spend, we're going to give a lot of money with relatively few strings attached to people who produce um, uh, vaccines. Talk about that and how how is Operation Warp Speed like a great example of what you're talking about and then where does it fall short? Yeah, I think you can look at Operation Warp Speed. Another example we talk about in the book is the Human Genome Project. Right. We are still benefiting from decades, decades yeah, later, yeah. and I've had my genome yeah, mapped. Yeah. Uh, have you? Have you? I, I have uh, 23 of me, so yeah. you know, close enough. And I mean, it's interesting because <laughs> Francis Collins, who was you know the hero of that story, is one of the villains, really. Of I, you know, I think Reason has written about this in trying to shut down various kind of responses to the state uh, during COVID, but be that as it may. Uh, yeah, let's talk about So warp when you speed. look at Operation Warp Speed, I, I think it was a very successful public-private effort, uh, public sector as both a funder, convener for this, but what they did was a number of important things. They set very, very clear goals mm -hmm. and, you know, get shots in people's arms as quickly as right. possible and prevent as many deaths as we can. They did a lot of deregulation, the regulatory relief, which was really, really key yeah. in, in this place. Uh, they did the funding and they actually then let the private sector, they gave them the freedom and flexibility to come up with different yeah. solutions. And th it wasn't a heavy touch. It was more of a light touch right. working with them. So this is where they kind of created certain frameworks and then said, like, as long as you're within this, right. you know, do what you're going to do. I mean, it's kind of fascinating because, and uh, you know, the book recounts this when COVID hit and people are like, okay, we need a vaccine. The best minds were all saying, well, you know, it could be like three to five yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, nobody was expecting, you know, to go from, uh, you know, January, February, March of 2020 to having shots in the arm, you know, by Thanksgiving. I mean, Trump said it. Nobody believed him, uh, right. but it did happen. So how does that, you know, at the same time, there's issues, right? Like where in order to expedite the, um, you know, getting shots in the arm, the government says, OK, we're definitely we're, we're committing to buying a lot of this stuff, whether kind of whether we need it or not. They cl clearly we needed it. Um, they also immunize companies against certain kinds of legal right. things. So, like, how do you balance all of that in in this kind of framework? Um, how do you do the cost benefit analysis of figuring out, okay, well, you know, yeah, we're we're going to make sure that they can't be sued or that they maintain intellectual property rights, even if some of the money that they use to develop it comes from taxpayers and things like that. Well, in the, in, the, in this case, it was you, we saw an existential sort of a threat. And uh, and so what they're able to do is that a lot, I mean, all during COVID in ways good and bad, a lot of the traditional procedures and regulations and everything that government had, a lot of those were waived. Yeah. And all of a sudden we saw telehealth, which had been impossible to do for all sorts of regulatory reasons for decades, then come online. And now we're never going back. We saw cloud computing. We saw people working remotely. So it's oftentimes during these situations of crisis and disaster that you're able to do a lot of looking at every rule and regulation and whether it makes sense or not, and you're going to waive it. And recently, I live on the West Coast, as uh, uh, East Coast, as do yeah. you, Nick. And um, you remember I-95, uh, and uh, essentially the bridge collapsed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in, outside of Philadelphia, they estimated it was going to take five months for it to be fixed. And that would have just created massive congestion problems, all sorts of other issues. And Governor Josh Shapiro said, you know, any, every single regulation that gets in the way of getting this done quickly, we're going to waive at this point. And what did they do through a public-private partnership, mostly a lot of private sector innovation, including bringing in NASCAR engineers uh, to, to help with it, they were able to get that bridge fixed in 12 days, 12 days. And one of the things that we talk a lot about in the book is 
what are the lessons we can learn from these disaster response when government is able to move very, very quickly and you need to then rethink a lot of the current regulations so government can be a lot more agile? So what happens, though, because, you know, with things like telehealth, I mean, this might be a little bit different, but, you know, various states waived uh, people having to get certified in their state in order to practice medicine, et cetera, and things like that. Um, a lot of workplace restrictions and regulations, a lot of things were waived during COVID, and then they start to come back, right? And the FDA, um, you know, it, you know, the FDA is not an agile organization, right? And they want to go back to the status quo before COVID and things like that. How do you work to, you know, lock in the liberating aspects of a deregulated kind of crisis environment? And we, during COVID, I wrote a, wrote a lot of studies uh, on what are the lessons learned, how do we overturn orthodoxies, and so on, what can we learn? And the speed at which government moved then was kind of unprecedented in many respects. And so it was like that. You're never going to have that over a long period of time because we do have checks and balances and democratic processes and so on to go forth. But what we don't want to do is go back to that old way. You want to learn a lot of the lessons and hopefully have a new normal. Right. And that's really the key point, a new normal looking at uh, based on lessons from those different crises. Do you think we've done that with, um, you know, it, it related to things like vaccines or de the delivery of medicine post-COVID? Like, have we learned lessons that are going to reset how we do things? We certainly, and our my my center produces. 50 to 60 studies a year on government management and technology. And we look a lot at public, private, and just around research and development uh, from the standpoint of medicine, pharmaceuticals, and so on. There's a lot of rethinking going on on that and how to do that better, how to use more open innovation models within those processes. How do we speed things up? Uh, and there's actually a lot of ways you can use technology are there, now. Are there, con like, who are the constituents for that? Because it's, you know, it's, it, I'm thinking of the political dynamics. And it's like during COVID, obviously no congressman or, you know, no, po no elected official wanted to be the person who was like, yeah, put this in your arm. And then, like, a lot of people die. Um, but, you know, there, you know, do they have an incentive to... Um, you know, once the crisis is gone to be like, yeah, you know what we should be doing is we should the government should be doing less in terms of regulating or or overseeing everything. I think it's less about doing less in regular than new regulatory models and using technology where I'm doing a lot of work right now on Gen AI and okay. AI and right. regulation yeah. and looking at that. And you can dramatically speed up all sorts of these processes mm -hmm. simply by using technology. I mean, Mark Andreessen years right. ago in his manifesto that software eats, <laughs> eats it, everything, yeah, it eats the world. Eats the yeah. world. And, and when, he when, also, he wrote one at the beginning of COVID time to build, uh, which, yeah. didn't, which didn't extend to a, uh, you know, a, uh, middle income housing development that was adjacent to one of his properties where he tried to get it quashed, but yeah. So it's about having regulatory yeah. processes which are more agile, yeah. which are outcome-based, which are looking at one of the areas that we're seeing governments all over the world do is uh, regulatory sandboxes. We've seen that in the fintech area. Yeah, explain where, that. That's uh, essentially where you bring in, the UK has been a leader in this area, you bring them into a sandbox, essentially, and you enable them to do various things that previously weren't allowed under close supervision. And what governments are doing is they're learning from how those technologies are progressing. And instead of going in early with precautionary regulation, they're actually stepping back and they're learning in a more controlled environment. And they've even found the startups that are part of these sandboxes end up getting more investment money. They do better over a long period of time. So it's a very different sort of model, you know, based on more of the innovation principle of regulation. And I think that's that's really positive things. I was on a World Economic Forum Futures Council where, where we had dozens of regulators from all over the world who are looking at these sort of more flexible models for regulating emerging technologies because they're moving too quickly for those old regulatory models to work very well. Um, what what do we do about the, you know, one of the things where there seems to be a new normal, I, I kind of referenced it earlier, 
you know, we went from, I think it was in 2019, the federal budget was like, I think, $4.8 trillion. Uh, and then it went up over $6 trillion very quickly because of COVID, because of a lot of federal spending. And then it went up to $6.8 trillion in 2021. And, you know, now it's down a little bit from that. But, you know, this is the kind of Robert Higgs crisis and Leviathan model that during a crisis, government expands spending expands and then it might come down a little bit but it doesn't come back to where it was how you know how do we steer clear of that kind of problem well my, my focus for the last couple of decades has really been on making government work better right, right. and uh, as opposed to the the overall size and I think those are there's those are a lot of policy decisions there are a lot of based on first principles we we don't seem to be having that debate uh, in America or many other countries around the world right yeah. now, and uh, I th I think you know depending on where interest rates go and the debt situation that may bring a, a lot of it back again. But as as you've seen with the the model that we have here, mm -hmm. if if you're really going to talk about the size of government and so on. Mm -hmm it needs to be based on where the government spending actually is today right. as opposed to where most of the debates are on which is a very very tiny fraction yeah. of the US budget what do you um, you know how do you I, I I don't know if you consider yourself like you know a, a libertarian or you know a, a small government conservative or or a, you know a small government liberal or a progressive or whatever but what um, you know, if government gets better, I guess this is my question is like if government gets better, will people demand more of it? Um, because I know a lot of libertarians that when you say and I've heard this, uh, you know, and people like Bob Poole and people at Reason Foundation who help implement better government policies. People, you know, I know a lot of libertarians who will say, uh, you know, why would you want to do that? I want government to suck as hard as possible because then people will get rid of it. Um, is does, is that borne out by data or, you know, how, uh, explain to, you know, libertarian, like to anarcho-capitalists, why it's actually worth t their time to have a government that, you know, runs its schools well? Well, this is a great discussion. And we, we had this discussion over a decade ago. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I actually even did a piece why libertarians uh, should stop hating government, kind of, because actually the data is pretty clear that those governments, where, when you have worse government, more bureaucratic government, and so when government can't get things done, it ends up being bigger, yeah. growing bigger over time. Which I mean, is very counterintuitive. But uh, it's it, it's yeah. because people keep putting more and more money into things and they're not working and then you have uh, all these processes and bureaucratic and sclerotic processes, a lot of rent seeking involved, a lot of bureaucracy and, and so on. So in fact, and just think about things in our everyday lives that it does make a big difference. So I ask a lot of people, what's the biggest innovation in government in the last decade or so that has made a difference in your lives? And for business travelers, it's things like TSA Pre and Global Entry and even Clear, which is more of a private sector. I, I just traveled to Europe. I was in London. I was in Paris and then back here. I breezed through the airport in ways that was similar to pre 9-11. Yeah. And those were based on having these systems that broke trade-offs. Innovation is about breaking trade-offs. So TSA pre global entry, they broke that trade-off between having more security and convenience. And they said, we can actually have both. So there are a lot of different ways that by reducing friction, by making government better, more efficient, it can actually improve our lives. It can actually lead to a much better business climate. I mean, think about the countries where government doesn't work at all. Very rarely is that business climate very good either uh, because there's so much friction in, in the system that, or in some of those countries where then you have a lot of both corruption mm -hmm. in the system. So, you know, I've always believed that better government can lead to more freedom for individuals, a better economic climate for businesses. And I think the data shows that out pretty clearly. Yeah, it's a couple of years ago, or more than a few, I wrote a story about how, um, you know, it's widely observed by economists and sociologists and whatnot around the globe that as societies go from high trust to low trust, right. you know, corruption increases and people know the government is corrupt, but they ask it to do more right. and more for them. and you know, in the United States in the reverse way, like during the 90s. And, you know, certainly Bill Clinton, 
you know, he didn't mean to elect a Republican majority in the House and the Senate. He, you know, but the way things ended up shaking out, government got better at what it was doing. It it stopped doing certain things. They balanced the budget. Yeah, and you know, and we actually, you know, government, the size, scope, and spending of government, relatively speaking, declined. Um, and then under Bush. When government started doing a lot of different things and it was not going well, whether it was in the economy or in wars and things like that, government grew. So it's an interesting – I mean, I, I take some flack for this and I, you know, I understand why. But the idea is that like libertarians won the argument that you know, the government can't do anything well and that doesn't lead to people saying, OK, I don't want government. It leads to them saying, well, I want more government. I want more government. Yeah. And then they're facing all these frustrations. So in the, yeah. in the UK – if you had the death of a loved one, uh, previously you had to notify already over 40 different agencies. Uh, type in that same information again and again and again. You weren't in that condition to do so. You're grieving for a loved one. They switched it to a process using digital government called Tell Us Once. Now you just have to tell the government once what that is, and they get information out to all these all the other agencies. And increasingly. I think you know the leading governments in the world who uh, around innovation and things like Estonia or Singapore are trying to figure out. They're talking about frictionless government. They're try talking about personalized government, basing things on life events. When you lose a job, or you're going on to college, or the birth of a child, the death of a loved one. How we organize pro services around that again to reduce all of that friction that currently exists in the fr in the system. And now with AI and digital government, we really have the ability to turbocharge that more than we've ever seen before. Who, um, who are the politicians in America who you think are doing the best job of really kind of pushing into a new model where it's not, okay, you know, when, you know, I'm not going to give you a job and, I'm, you know, and then your kids and your family, et cetera, like that, but people who are like, you know what? What we're going to try and do is just create a general framework where government helps, but it's not on the. Uh, you know, it it a lot of different people, a lot of different innovation is happening. Well, I th I think when you when we look at from a bridge building standpoint, uh, government um, politicians who have made that kind of a key part of their governing mm -hmm. philosophy. Uh, one of the individuals we talk a lot about is John Hickenlooper when he was mayor of Denver and then governor of Colorado, extremely popular then across the different parties. And he made public-private partnerships at the center of his governing philosophy. And he was always looking at how do we create mutual advantage between the sectors, always reaching out to them. And that actually brought in a lot of bipartisan support to support from companies. He, he was able to raise over $295 million mm -hmm. towards these public initiatives. And that was at the very core of everything he did. And then as mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, again, you know, coming Ooh, from the business yes. community and coming from a foundation community, he deeply understood the sectors. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, that became a key part. So you can disagree with yeah. all sorts of other stuff you might have done, but those were two individuals who understood how to create mutual advantage yeah. between and the Bloomberg sectors. Bloomberg is really interesting because, you know, I, I live in New York, so I talk to a lot of people who are, you know, both, you know, at, at, at every stratum of society. And one of the things, particularly in the wake of Bill de Blasio and now Eric Adams, people who may not have liked many elements of Bloomberg, they're like, you know what, like, you know, trash was collected better. The roads were kept better for the most part. Um, and it was a good business climate, which made everything better off. Um, where, uh, you know, but is Bloomberg, like, we're not going to see the likes of him very often, right? And I'm not, you know, totally saying he was great by any stretch, but that, you know, that type of person who has, you know, government experience, nonprofit experience, and business experience, like, you know, that just, he's kind of a unicorn in that, right? Well, Governor, I, I find really interesting is uh, someone you've had in your podcast before is Governor Jared Paulus yeah. uh, from. Colorado, Colorado. Yeah. who I think is, is a He's little like bit a in that He's like a centimillionaire from uh, an online group.
greeting card company. He really yeah. understands technology yeah. really well. I think that he's, his beliefs are uh, a little bit iconoclastic in certain ways, which I find really interesting and doing a, a really good job governing the state. And on the uh, uh, other side of the country, in a way, uh, he's no longer governor, but Larry Hogan mm -hmm. as governor of Maryland is very pragmatic, business oriented, and he, along with uh, another moderate Republican, then Charlie Baker from Massachusetts, were two of the most popular governors in the country. What was, what, you know, what did Hogan do? And he's always being floated as like a third, you know, a no labels type candidate, et cetera. Also had to work with a, a super democratic legislature and stuff. But like, what were, you know, what's the takeaway from, from a Larry Hogan that should be replicated in other places? The the takeaway is problem solving. Mm -hmm. Focus on solving problems. He was very pragmatic. The state was run well. They had a lot of innovation in areas like workforce development, which is a huge issue in the country. Yeah, well, Among what that most means. governors, the notion of upskilling the workforce to meet 21st century needs, whether it's an AI or or solar or wind, is is really one of their most important topics uh, areas. Of, uh, issue or orient and what Hogan did as governor was they had something called earn Maryland which in contrast to most workforce development programs it was industry led which meant that they said you know what industry knows a lot better than we do as government officials what their needs are and so we're going to let them apply for grants together and we're going to give out competitive grants to industry and it's usually different uh, nonprofits who are running these different things and they're gonna they're gonna create the curriculum and they're gonna change it. We're gonna let them be very agile, depending on the very changing workforce needs. And that was just what. And it was a very successful program. We talk about it in the book as a real model. And that's where a lot of other uh, states are now going in workforce development. But he had a lot of initiatives like that, which are very very I would say pragmatic, business minded, focused on what works. Yeah. What do you think of people like uh, Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott? You know, Texas and Florida, and they very much kind of push back. If you look at, you know, the, the you know Texas, I talked to Jeb Bush recently, who's somebody you're very familiar with. Um, but, you know, Florida, California, Texas, uh, New York are the four most populous states in the country. And it's an interesting thing where California and New York are very much kind of blue models of of states, uh, they have high taxes, high regulation, and they promise a high level of government services. Whether they deliver that or not is a different question. And then, you know, Florida and Texas are red models, right? Where they say we're going to cut government, we're going to, we don't have an income tax, we don't regulate business as much. Um, you know, are Abbott and DeSantis doing something right? Because that's like Florida had more people move to it than any other state. Uh, last year, um, you know, how do, how do you evaluate somebody like a DeSantis and a and a, and a, a Greg Abbott? Well, I don't want to comment on uh, those individual politicians. The, the one thing I, I would say, yeah. though, in the kind of climate we're in, which is so partisan and so ideological, that oftentimes we are failing to see some of the positives in a lot of different states. So let's say a, a California right now. Um, you know, California is pretty well positioned for uh, the next uh, or the AI revolution with literally well over half of all of the leading AI, tech, uh, AI companies out of California, as well as climate tech and other areas. So I think a lot of the states have different things going for them. And what we should be looking at as, as a country, what are the different regions that are, acceler that are excelling in different technology areas? And what are the best ways of supporting them, creating those economic climates for getting ready for this is really, we're in the fourth industrial revolution, essentially, which is an AI and digital revolution. And we're going to have to compete and against the rest of the world in that respect. So what what's good in Florida, though? I mean, leave DeSantis out. Why, you know, why are so many people moving there? Why are jobs growing there? It's it's just not my area necessarily. Yeah. Okay, um, let me ask. As um, you know, your first book, I believe, was Revolution at the Roots, right? That you wrote with uh, John O'Leary, and if I'm remembering correctly, that had a blurb from Newt Gingrich on it. Uh, and this was in the mid '90s. It was interesting, and I think with even by the end of the '90s, people recognized that Newt Gingrich was, you know, there's something wrong with him. 
Uh, but there was that interplay of like him and Bill Clinton, who, you know, are like weird twins. Right. I mean, they're they're both sons of the South. They're both intellectual, uh, you know, raised by kind of odd single mothers and distant fathers and all. I mean, it's just it's fascinating that they were around at the same time. Um, but can you reflect a little bit on your like the political or ideological or intellectual journey that you've been on over the past 30 years? Because that I mean, you know, what did Revolution at the Roots get right? What did it get wrong? And, you know, where are you now in relation to where you started? Well, I, I think the most important thing about my intellectual journey is I've really tried to focus increasingly on what the data shows, what does the evidence show, and to avoid uh, what we talked about in one of our books, uh, John and I, which is uh, called the Tolstoy syndrome, which is essentially confirmation bias. Yeah. And, and to really be focused on what's working, what's not working, how do we change these systems? Because you know, at, this, at the city level, Nick, you can't govern by ideology. Right. It just doesn't work. Um, that's not how you get potholes filled or anything else. It's all about really nitty gritty of these systems. So I've really focused more and more of my time and attention on understanding these systems, understanding policy implementation, because I believe that when you look at a billion dollars going into think tanks in America in many respects, like the, f the percentage of that that actually talks about how do you make these things work is, is very, very low. And even look at something like originally California electricity deregulation. Mm -hmm. It was passed unanimously. Yeah, uh, which was the first sign that it was not a good yeah, idea. Yeah, because they, they essentially wrote it to pass the legislature not to work in the real world. And of course, Enron was able to game that yeah. system. So what they didn't spend enough time is wargaming all the ways that this could go wrong and really looking at market design. So, so my work has really been focused uh, in that in that respect, looking at these systems and how do you structure the systems and markets and incentives the best way to create the most public value. Are you optimistic? I mean, we're in a, a very, uh, you know, fraught, polarized uh, period, um, you know, and certainly discourse is not good. People seem to be more tribally identifying with one side or the other when it comes to Democrats and Republicans. Are you optimistic about, you know, the next five or 10 years of that changing or eh, it's like it doesn't really matter? <laughs> well, it's one of the one of the re reasons why I've always loved your work and Matt's work, because you have pointed out time and time again all the different ways things are getting better. And uh, we have so much pessimism now and almost nihilism in certain respects. And yet when you look at the next five to six years or so, the U.S. is incredibly well positioned for the future if we can take advantage of it. Uh, about three-fourths of the leading AI companies in the world out of the 50 top are from the U.S. Uh, we have the we have the overwhelming number of companies that are engaged in climate technology and investments in that area and space is another area and we do have the best kind of innovation ecosystem set up between universities private sector research labs federal government funding and so forth in the world in many respects and we're ranked uh, it's number three behind sweden and uh switzerland i believe in terms of uh innovation climate in the U.S. So there's, there's a lot of really positive things there, and you don't read about that at all. And, and the sentiment from voters is so negative in many respects. And it doesn't, it doesn't actually connect with what the data shows. Yeah, so is that, a, is that a problem that you know, people are living, you know, they think they're living in a world, that, you know, the, a, a dystopia that's mostly in their head? Well, obviously, some some people are suffering inflation's yeah, yeah. been going up and everything but even among the experts and among the people who are on tv the reality right now and when you look at the data it doesn't jive at all with the negativism and the pessimism that we see and it's not only in the u.s we see some of this in a lot of yeah. other parts of the world but i was just in india six months ago and absolutely amazing, so much more positive energy. But I was in something called the Tech City in Hyderabad, where uh, there's hundreds of thousands of tech workers working it for U.S. companies, international companies, 
becoming middle class, upper middle class, and 10 years ago, it didn't even exist. It was forest land. And so there's a lot of more hope there. And I just think we need to regain some of that hope uh, in order to, to move forward because, you know, as the work of Steven Pinker has showed and others, a lot of things are getting a lot better. Uh, final question. Um, put this in generational context. Um, you know, it, it seems like younger people, younger millennials and Gen Z are pretty pessimistic. I mean, they have been uh, they've been raised marinating in a story about climate disaster and climate apocalypse, uh, about, you know, uh, about not being able to afford a car, a house, not being able to get a full time job, all of these things, all of which I you know, without going into detail, we can say, OK, these are all overblown. Um, but. You know, is are younger generations likely to be optimistic? And, you know, if they are or, you know, are they more likely to go into the private sector or into government or are they, you know, somebody like Peter Thiel at the end of uh, zero to one talked about how, you know, too many of us now, particularly young people, are waiting for the future to be invented rather than, you know, kind of doing it ourselves. Um, you know, how how how. Do the dynamics that you're talking about play out among younger people? Well, I'm not an expert on on generations. No. Uh, I have seen a lot of that data, which uh, which I think is very concerning. But one area that I do find really interesting, I'm a big science fiction fan. And um, if you look at the science fiction from decades ago, Robert Heinlein and others, it was, a lot of it showed this sort of utopian vision of the future. And that then inspired people like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and many others. And the science fiction over the last few decades has almost all been dystopian. Mm -hmm. And so you, it's hard for people to see this really positive future because you don't see a lot of it in, in our popular culture today and um, and and so where do, where do they get to see in terms of what the possibilities are uh, I think if you look out to 2040 and others when we have AI embedded into every element of our society in various ways and we're, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about and bullish about uh, but if people never see that if they never yeah. see the vision that's I think that's really yeah. There's not a lot of positive stories about AI. Could you? And I said yeah. that was the last thing I yeah. want to ask you real quick. Um, it, you know, can you just very quickly sketch how AI is going to make everyday life better? Because this <laughs> no, it, it's fascinating and it and it follows a very kind of understandable cycle. Like a new technology reaches a certain level, and then everybody's like, "This is the end of the world," and it's like. Not really, but you know, make can you make a quick case for how AI is going to make life better for us? Well, people talk about AI being the the new electricity and all the different. Think about all the different ways electricity changed our lives. Even even in Manhattan, where you live, the development of the skyscrapers. It used to be if you were really wealthy, you'd live on the bottom floors because you didn't want a Hawkeye. So. Yeah electricity went into every element of our lives and manufacturing mm -hmm. and the homes yeah. and everything and it transformed it but it took us a couple decades to figure out all the changes and processes to realize that now it's actually going to happen a little bit faster i think with ai but just think about things such as foreign languages well there's already something out today where i can be speaking to you you can be speaking in japanese and i can be speaking this, in speaking italian of, of an older but i don't know if it counts as utopian yeah. or dystopian but um uh, Douglas Adams the yeah. hitchhiker's guide the whole which kind of idea of a babel fish which is one book. of them is called right yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that and i guess there's things like helping to maintain schedules well, and, and even like, like think about writing. Yeah, you know, a lot of people aren't that great writing. It's their third language, second language, and all of a sudden yeah. they could put them through a, an AI yeah. tool, and that mm -hmm. that is able to do that. You have the world's knowledge at your fingertips, mm -hmm. and you're able to pull all of that. We're going to have our productivity increases go up. We're probably going to have more leisure time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to be tied to our phones anymore because it's going to be with gestural sort of interfaces yeah. in the real world. Anytime we go to see any sort of a monument or anything else, we'll be able to understand the history of it. Just look at it from augmented reality we won't need to chain children to desks sitting in desks all day long because they'll be out in the real world learning about it and with a digital overlay over it there's a million ways it's going to be really exciting and it's we're seeing 
we're seeing the kind of exponential breakthroughs right now in AI. The technology is increasing at the kind of rate that we saw with Moore's law in the digital technologies. And so we don't know exactly how it's all going to turn out, but I tell you, I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that can really uh, kind of screw that up? Well, obviously, you've, you've got to have the right regulatory regimes, and we're looking at a, a lot of that. Preferably right little now. to none, <laughs> either from my side, but. Well, there has to, yeah. there's some harm that can be yeah. pre prevented. You know, obviously, I think a lot of the fears on uh, some of the very existential fears people have on AI right now are way overblown. We're not anywhere near artificial general intelligence. Uh, uh, right now, certainly from a, I, I think, from a warfare perspective and so on, and drones and autonomous drones, I, I think there's some real dangers there. But certainly there's a lot of different dangers, but we always have faced those with different technologies and we've been able to overcome them. And I think we understand what those are better now than we did with social media technologies of two decades ago. Yeah. All right, we're going to leave it there. Uh, the book is Bridge Builders, How Government Can Transcend Boundaries to Solve Big Problems. The co-author is uh, William D. Eggers. Uh, Will, thank you for talking to Reason. Thanks, Nick. Great to be back with you. Mm -hmm.